we know what a region is. It's a place that shares something in common. There are many different types of regions, so how do geographers classify them? Well, geographers have classified regions into three different groups. Formal, functional, and vernacular. Our first type of region is a formal region. I like to picture Jesus in a tuxedo t-shirt because it says like, I want to be formal, but I'm here to party too. No, not that kind of formal. A formal region, otherwise known as a homogeneous or uniform region. A formal region is an area where everyone shares one or more distinct characteristic or trait. Geographers use formal regions to help explain broad patterns such as religion or level of development. They are often very general in nature. When looking at regions, don't forget that maps lie. Formal regions usually only reveal the majority group. Often there are also large minority groups to consider as well. An easy way to identify a formal region is that it is based on facts, so it can be proven to exist. Geographers collect data to prove that formal regions exist. So, formal regions can be defined by many different measures, including total population, population density, distribution, per capita income, and so on. It can also include physical mapping characteristics like temperature, rainfall, or growing seasons. Formal regions include human characteristics like language, religion, nationality, economic activity, or political systems. Formal regions can also be physical traits such as, wait, not the rock, yeah, that's better, that kind of rock. Like I was saying, formal regions also can be physical traits such as climate, landforms, or vegetation. Let's look at some examples. Remember, formal regions are regions you can prove exist. Formal regions can be based on physical traits. For example, the Rocky Mountains are a formal region. All of the people living in this region share the mountains in common. The Amazon River is also a formal region. We can prove that each river in the basin traces back to the Amazon River, like this. By tracing all of the rivers, you can easily map out a formal region, the Amazon River Basin. Climate zones are also examples of environmental traits. Climate zones are formal regions because they share similar temperature and precipitation levels. We can definitely prove that by using data. That data would be precipitation and temperature. Other examples of environmental formal regions include vegetation patterns and biomes like the grasslands or maybe even tundra. Language areas can be formal regions based on cultural traits. In this case, people share related languages in common. We can also draw conclusions that culture might be similar too in these regions. We also have world culture regions, oftentimes tied into language. People typically share similar languages, religions, and customs in these regions. Sometimes you can have formal regions that will include multiple traits. We can also look at political entities, such as counties, states, countries, and provinces. They are all formal regions because they are defined by a common political identity. For example, let's look at Sweet Home Alabama here. Alabama's boundaries are recognized by everyone and they are very clearly drawn. Everyone is a citizen that lives under the same laws and pays the same state taxes. These common traits make Alabama a formal region. We can all prove these common traits and that makes Alabama a formal region. We can also prove voting patterns through data. Voting patterns definitely are a formal region. Here the regions are examined at different scales, voters by state and voters by county. Economic traits can also be used to create formal regions. This is the Corn Belt, an area of the U.S. where corn is the dominant crop grown. Corn is a trait that is common and we can prove that using USDA data and that makes this a formal region. We can even see formal regions within this photo of an Inuit hunter with his dog sled team. It is important to note that formal regions can include multiple traits that are shared in common rather than just one. Various facets of a multi-trait formal region can be seen here, including the clothing, the use of dog sleds as transportation, and hunting as a livelihood system. The next type of region is called the functional region. Functional regions are also sometimes called nodal regions. A functional region is a region that is organized around a center, otherwise known as a node or a core. That core is linked to surrounding areas. In simpler terms, it's a central place and the surrounding areas that are affected by it. We can easily spot functional regions because they have a use. 
they wouldn't be a functional region if they didn't have a use. Functional regions are defined by activities, connections, interactions. They begin in the core, they become less important or prevalent the further you travel away from the node. This would be an example of distance decay. The area where the trait begins to disappear is often called the periphery. Because of this, the boundary edges of functional regions are often fuzzy and less defined than formal regions. Some of the uses in functional regions include transportation, communication, utilities, economic associations, including manufacturing or retail. The Chicagoland area, as seen in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, is a great example of a functional region. Chicago with its highways, railways, Great Lakes shipping, airlines, and telecommunications is a focal point in the north central region of the United States. So here's the core of that functional region right there, uh, downtown Chicago, and the periphery would extend way out into other states including Indiana, Michigan, and Wisconsin. We can definitely see the use here, the functions, could be shipping, transportation, communication, etc. This image clearly illustrates the node of a functional region in Denver. That node would be right in this area here. Um, in this diagram, it would look like the central city. The dense cluster of commercial buildings is sometimes called the central business district, and that is the node that coordinates activities throughout the area that surrounds it, the periphery. The periphery would include things like the suburbs and the rural areas surrounding the city of Denver. Another example of a functional region would be highways, subways, or in this case, airline service areas. Our next example is TV network coverage. Each television market has a node usually based in a large city. The periphery of the network includes suburban and rural markets nearby. As you can see from many of these functional regions, they cross state boundaries. Here's a better illustration at a larger scale so that we can get a better look. The colored circles represent households where more than 50% of the households are served by an NBC station. The blue circle in the middle represents NBC's Des Moines affiliate. The core is the city itself and it extends outward. The range that includes the dotted line, that range right there, shows that viewers diminish further from the core as that region has 25 to 49% of viewers. Also note that functional regions often can overlap. The Des Moines market overlaps with markets in Omaha, Sioux City, and Cedar Rapids, so it's always important to look at those overlaps when we're analyzing the space. Other functional regions include shopping regions centered on malls or supermarkets, areas served by branch banks and ports and their hinterlands. An example is newspaper circulation. So here we have the circulation market for the Washington Post, it has an origin, the hearth, in the center there. It has a region that extends from the node, the periphery. Um, fewer people will subscribe further from the node and will begin subscribing to other newspaper that cover news in their region. Obviously, in this case, the use is newspapers. Other examples would include cell phone coverage. Verizon will deliver their service to the red functional region, while AT&T will send their service to the blue functional region. Bank networks can also be examples. Um, this map shows the linkages between large banks of major central cities and the corresponding banks that they serve in smaller towns. Together, the main bank and all of its branches form a functional region. Functional regions can also cover market areas of chain restaurants or chain stores like In-N-Out Burger on this map, which is based out of California. As you can see, it has expanded to nearby areas and those would be functional regions. Another great example are delivery areas. Here you can see an example for a pizza shop. And our last map shows where fans of baseball teams live. Note that the boundaries often go across state lines again. What this map does not show is that some of these regions do overlap with fans from one or more teams living within that overlap. So sometimes these maps can be a little bit deceiving. 
The third type of region is called the vernacular region. Sometimes it is also called a perceptual region because it is based on what people think about a place. So basically their opinion. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. A vernacular region is a place that people believe exists as part of their cultural identity or popular perception of cultural identity. They are based on human feelings and attitudes about areas, which are also referred to as sense of place. There are no facts here. Vernacular regions are based on opinions. Boundaries are even less defined than functional regions because they lack structure. So if we're comparing the three, the formal regions have very clear boundaries. We measure them, we can prove them. Uh, functional regions we can see fairly clearly, but at the edges they get a little bit fuzzy, and vernacular regions are going to be different for different people. So they are going to lack structure and are going to be much harder to define. We also have to be very careful with vernacular regions because they are often formed on the basis of stereotypes that may be inappropriate or incorrect. For example, if you think that all people in the South are hillbillies, or that all Asians are smart, that could get you into some trouble because it's not true. Many stereotypes contain elements of truth, but most do not reflect reality. Wilbur Zielinski is a famous cultural geographer that worked extensively with perceptual regions. He looked at telephone books for more than 276 major metro areas in the US and Canada, noting businesses that use terms to define region like the Southern Printing Company. He used this data to create a map of regions. And here's that map. He identified 12 major perceptual regions of North America in an article entitled North America's Vernacular Regions. You should notice that some regions overlap and there are also some places that have no regional affiliation at all. This spot right here, up here. So let's take a look at an example, the South. Aren't you boiling hot in that outfit? No. It's like 80 degrees in this hallway. Where are you from, the South? Yes. Deep South. <laughs> Southerners and most Americans have a strong sense of the South. It is a place of pride for some and a place that others want to avoid. The South is defined differently by different people, and that makes it a vernacular region. It definitely does not have boundaries on which everyone can agree. So how do we know when we're in the South? We could drive from New York down I-95 and see how the cultural landscape changes. For example, we could go into Waffle House restaurants and check out their menu. What we would be looking for are examples of southern foods, for example, grits. When the menu changes to include grits, we know that we are probably entering the south. There are lots of different ways to measure this, though. Is the south just former Confederate states? A place where the Baptist religion is prevalent? Is it based on food preference and dialect? This map shows many definitions for the South, and as you can see, the South's borders are not precise on this map. It is important to mention here that vernacular regions can have cores and peripheries too. For example, in this map, there's an area of dark green, and that will be the core, because it meets at least six definitions for what the South is. The periphery areas would be the lighter areas, where there's just one or two definitions that define the South. Other examples of vernacular regions could include things like the Midwest, Southern California, and up north. There are political vernacular regions like Kurdistan. It doesn't officially exist as a state, and the boundaries are drawn differently by different people. We could also look at preference maps. Where do people think the best place to live is? Well, that's going to depend on where that person is from. People generally like living in the place that they were born. The darker colors represent the most desirable places to live. As you can see where California students would like to live, it's going to be darker near California. Um, there is some preference for New York City and New York area as well. It is much different from where Pennsylvania students want to live. Again, they do like California, but the core of where they would like to live is going to be where home is. We can look at perceptual regions at different scales, too. Uh, they could include what we think about other countries or what we think about places within our state. So this is a map of perceptual regions in Texas where people have named regions based on some kind of perception of what it's like there. All right, so there you have it, the three types of regions. 
After viewing this video, you should be able to tell the difference between a formal, functional, and vernacular region. You should also be able to give examples of each type of region. And I'm going to leave you with a regional joke. An Alabama state trooper pulls over a pickup truck in I-80 and says to the driver, Got any ID? The driver pauses, obviously thinking hard, and then responds, Idea? Idea about what? Well, those are the kind of stereotypes I warned you about. Well, that's all for now, and until next time, explore the world around you.